Brittany Britton. Welcome to today's Wildlife for Lunch. Today's uh, topic is integrating cattle and wildlife on small acreage. And it's going to be presented by Larry Pierce of Texas AgriLife Extension Service. The Wildlife for Lunch series is made possible through funding provided by the San Antonio Livestock Exposition, Inc. And it's hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and Texas AgriLife Extension. There is one hour of IPM Pest Management CEU credit available for today's webinar. So if you're interested in obtaining that CEU credit, uh, you must attend the live webinar. Unfortunately, no CEU credit can be given for attending or viewing archived versions. But you must attend the live webinar. Uh, after the webinar, there will be a survey that automatically pops open um, in your browser window. You must complete that survey. Um, at the end of the survey, there are some questions uh, in order to get the CEU credit. So make sure you complete that survey. Uh, and those questions, you're going to have to provide your name, your address, um, your applicator's license number. And if you don't know that, you can provide your driver's license number. So make sure that you have one of those two things handy by the end of the presentation today. Um, if you have any questions or issues with CEU credit, feel free to reach out to me, uh, Courtney Britton at Texas Wildlife Association. And I'll be handling uh, the CEU credit from here on out. You can expect to receive via email um, a CEU certificate from me um, in about a week. So it'll take us a little while to get all that um, information submitted to TDA. But once we do, you'll get a certificate from me. So you'll, you can expect to see that in your, e in your email inbox. Um, if you don't get a certificate in about a week or so, uh, give me an email. Make sure that we can uh, get you covered. OK, and with that, Larry, I am about to turn it over to you. Let me go ahead and unmute your mic here and pass you the, the baton, so to speak. OK, and it's all yours. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm excited to be here. Uh, this is a new experience for me, and I'm looking uh, very much forward to it. I want to approach uh, today's presentation on integrating cattle and wildlife on small acreage from the perspective that uh, we're a landowner who already has cattle or uh, is the landowner who's considering cattle on acreage, uh, primarily to maintain an ag valuation on our property. So let's first talk about small acreage. In the area of Texas where I'm located, which is central Texas uh, in Washington County, Brenham, about uh, halfway between Austin and Houston, uh, I would consider small acreage to be anywhere from five to a hundred acres, and uh, you know, five acres is a, a kind of bare minimum to have an ag valuation on. And I realize that in some counties uh, that might not even be a possibility. Uh, in our area here, I would say about 30 acres is about the average size tract that that we'll deal with for uh, livestock and considerations of wildlife. Let's talk about some things that you need to know if you're considering integrating cattle and wildlife on your acreage. I think first and foremost, it's very important that we know our soil. Uh, and that uh, plays a big role in things that uh, we decide to do in terms of management, such as food plots, and hay production, pasture management, and uh, even erosion control potential. If we don't know our soils, then, then we really have a hard time managing our, our land properly. One of the great tools that USDA NRCS provides for us to get to know our soils is the Web Soil Survey. Uh, you can access that website at websoilsurvey.nrcs.usda.gov. Um, or you can also go to your soil survey handbook, which was printed uh, many years ago for every county in Texas, and uh, take a look at the soil type or types that may be on the land that you have. But uh, the information that's available on Web Soil Survey and in the soil survey handbook is excellent information. Uh, you can learn about uh, grasses that uh, should be on the property historically in terms of native grasses. You can also learn about the erosion potential of the soil if it's suitable for construction. You know, if you're thinking about building a barn or house, uh, you can even learn information on um, installing uh, septic systems and things of, of that nature in the soil survey handbook. I think another important thing to know is stocking rate. 
Uh, and stocking rate's going to depend on several things. What type of grass do you have on the property? Is it an introduced grass or is it native grasses? And how much forage is available? And depending on the size of the cattle that you may have, how many pounds of uh, forage are those animal animals are going to consume on a monthly basis. And those, those uh, items play a role in determining the stocking rate. Uh, you also need to know your livestock. You need to be able to do body con get condition scoring to determine if those livestock or, or cattle are getting uh, adequate nutrition uh, from your grazing strategy. Also, uh, do some study on what are suitable breed types in the area where you live. Or, are uh, Brangus uh, cattle good or Angus cattle good or those Brahmin influence type of cattle uh, certainly ones that you need to consider. Uh, that's, a, that's an important part, uh, especially as today's cattle have gotten larger and larger over the years. We don't want an animal that consumes a tremendous amount of forage if we're going to be on small acreage. Uh, we also need to know, and let's move to the next slide here, about our our weeds or forbs, uh, if we've got toxic plants or not. Uh, that's certainly something that can play a role if we, we're grazing cattle. If we've got toxic plants out there, some of these can certainly be toxic for wildlife as well. Uh, but also uh, those weeds can be beneficial forbs for wildlife. So we need to know what's out there, be able to identify it and know what value it has for both uh, livestock or threat to livestock and both benefit and threat to wildlife. We also need to know what types of wildlife we can expect to see on our property and what are their habitat requirements. And that's, that's another important issue. Uh, if we don't expect to see white-tailed deer, then, you know, we probably don't need to manage habitat for white-tailed deer. Uh, if, we, if we don't have a significant population of bobwhite quail in the area, perhaps we want to choose maybe to manage for white-tailed deer if they're in greater abundance in the area. Uh, we also need to know about our pond. Is it reliable uh, in terms of a water source? Uh, can we count on it to go dry if it starts to get uh, dry in the summer? Um, and if we if we do not have a reliable pond, perhaps we need to learn more about what to do. Do we need to put a liner in that pond to help it hold water? Maybe use some bentonite to seal up any leaks. What do we need to do to get that pond in shape as a water source? It's also important to understand our woodland areas and our riparian zones. If we have these on our property, we need to identify them and be familiar with them and know how to manage them and protect them. I think it's very important that we know our budget as we move into livestock management and consider wildlife. Uh, we just got to know how many available dollars we have to invest in this enterprise. Let's talk a little bit about understanding wildlife habitat and what are those necessities. Obviously, we need food, water, cover, shelter, and space for these animals on our property. Now, we may not have all these items on the property, but we need to know in, if they're in close proximity, especially water. We don't want those animals to have to travel too far uh, if we don't have a good, reliable source for, for wildlife water. Now, we may have water troughs and things for cattle, and uh, certainly deer are going to use those. And we also should maybe take a look and see if those water sources are friendly for, for wildlife. Aldo Leopold tells us or told us that we can uh, use the same tools that we've destroyed the land with to help restore it. The axe, cow, plow, fire, and gun. So I want to uh, incorporate uh, these tools into the remainder of the slide so we can begin to understand how we can uh, use uh, these to our advantage uh, to support both our cattle operation and, and our wildlife operation. I found this picture earlier, and I think it uh, stresses the point that I come across a, a lot with landowners, and it's it's really the the fear of of closing the gate, or uh, the need to close the gate, or maybe even how long to keep the gate closed. Uh, this is something that I didn't realize myself till later in life, as I got a formal education in animal science, and and uh, 
and and learned that uh, in, in my young life, uh, raising livestock and cattle with my dad, uh, we, we had a problem with closing the gate. So I think it's important to know uh, that sometimes you've got to close the gate. And uh, we, we like to use that uh, standard rule of thumb of take half, leave half when we're grazing. So we're going to try to take half the forage that's available and, in terms of grazing and then leave half there uh, and rotate the cattle off uh, to another area. And that leads into the importance of rotational grazing. I think it's very important that we, we develop those cross fences and establish a rotational grazing method. There's lots of different methods out there. Uh, I like the high intensity, low frequency method. Um, <clears throat> I think it, it gives us an opportunity to come in and graze with lots of animals in an area and then move those animals on to another spot and then allow time for rest before we return those animals to that same pasture. Uh, again, we need to know our stocking rate. That's very important. Uh, and, and introduced grasses or native grasses would certainly play a role in that, as we mentioned before. And then. Uh, Cross fencing is certainly something that's of great importance to help us as a tool to manage those cattle around the property. And again, understanding the importance of closing that gate when we move cattle from one pasture to another is um, certainly uh, something that we need to understand. Uh, also, uh, one option, instead of continuously grazing cattle, for the entire year, you might consider uh, stalker cattle and only have them on the property for six months. Uh, that may allow you uh, more flexibility in your operation, so that's certainly something to consider. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the benefits of grazing. Certainly it cre creates habitat diversity on our property. Uh, that period periodic disturbance helps uh, stimulate new growth and it helps helps keep that habitat open. And uh, if you think about a woodland area uh, that may be uh, grown up in uh, Yopon and different brush species, as we bring those cattle in and out of that area, we help open that area up. Those cattle consume those items to some degree and help create some pathways for deer to travel in a woodland area. Establishment of food plots is also something that we can consider. Um, we could either plant uh, desired species, uh, maybe iron and clay cow peas, perhaps, uh, maybe some type of grain sorghum, uh, depending on the, the species that we're trying to target in terms of wildlife. Is that a, a, a game bird such as quail or is that white-tailed deer? And certainly, uh, based on that, we can we can pick the appropriate uh, plants for food plots. Or we could just uh, disc some strips, perhaps along the woods, uh, to stimulate the growth of new forbs and create that uh, diversity that we need in terms of food for, for wildlife. You know, once again, if, if you're establishing those food plots, it's important to get your soil tested in those areas so you know uh, the nutrients that are available in the soil and know how to amend the soil accordingly. Uh, otherwise, you, you might be spending money on unnecessary fertilization. Or uh, if you uh, need fertilization and don't know about it, you may never be successful with, with that particular food plot. Another consideration would be to plant native grasses and forbs on the property, especially if if you've got the introduced grasses and you're you're leaning more toward uh, something that would be beneficial for wildlife. And these are some of the native grass varieties that are. Uh, are uh, found in the area of Texas where I am, and uh, many of them are going to be similar, or all of them are going to be similar to the area. Uh, some of the forbs that we use here in our, our mixes may be different from those in your area, but certainly you can uh, refer to the Web Soil Survey or, or the Soil Survey Handbook uh, to get a better understanding of those native grasses that might be found in your area. 
Overseeding of winter pastures is something else that we could do that would benefit uh, both our livestock and wildlife. There are a number of things that we could use to overseed those introduced grass pastures with for the winter. Uh, this is going to help us with some uh, food and cover for wildlife and also provide us with some additional grazing. Uh, if we pick a legume, legume crop like clovers or vetches, then we're also uh, gaining some nitrogen fixation from those type crops as well. So that can help perhaps reduce uh, cost to us in terms of pasture fertilization in the long run. Uh, and if we allow uh, some of these uh, plant species to reseed, we can get a follow-up crop the next year and that will further help reduce our cost. Many of us would have uh, large enough acreage to produce some hay perhaps for our livestock. Uh, I would encourage maybe uh, considering the purchase of hay. Uh, this would provide you more grazable acres throughout the year. Uh, you can use that hay meadow for grazing and, and don't have to hold the cattle out of it to allow it to grow to make hay. Um, this would also reduce our need for uh, fertilizer inputs and help reduce our production cost. Again, you could consider planting those native grasses, uh, especially if you've got an introduced uh, grass hay meadow. You could convert that over to native grasses and that would certainly benefit wildlife. Consideration of uh, shredding or mowing those uh, hay fields versus chemical application for weed control. Uh, I think that uh, is an important consideration. Again, that would help reduce cost of production and be a little more friendly uh, for us. Uh, when we think about hay production and uh, mowing that hay, we want to start in the middle of the field. and. Uh, especially during a time like now when we've got young fawns on the ground and we're trying to make hay, if we start mowing down the middle of the field, hopefully those fawns are old enough, they'll get up out of the way and move toward the edge of the field or maybe move off into the, the woodland border of the hay meadow and, uh, and escape the danger of the, the tractor and the hay mower. Many fawns are, are killed each year uh, when, we, when we start to harvest hay because they just don't get up and move out of the way. So hopefully by starting in the middle will give them that chance to, to move on. And I always like to leave a border around the edge of the hay field uh, just for that same reason. So they have that escape cover to go to if they do leave the meadow and lay down on the edge. They've, they've got a place to feel protected and safe. Also, if we're uh, considering shredding a pasture um, for weed control, we'd, we'd want to keep that same consideration in mind uh, when doing that mowing practice as well. Let's talk a little about pasture weed control, um, using chemicals versus shredding or mowing that pasture. Uh, again, the use of chemicals can reduce those beneficial legumes that perhaps we've overseeded. Um, over time, certainly can eliminate those legumes uh, and also reduce those beneficial forb species that we may need for wildlife. So think about that if you're if you're using chemicals and uh, spending a lot of money out there uh, trying to keep weeds out of the pasture. Maybe you want to reconsider that and uh, just shred those down or mow those down, and uh, and the benefits uh, are apparent there in the the legumes that we can keep on hand and uh, the, the number of different forb species that will happen as a result. Fertilization of pastures is something that I think uh, fewer and fewer um, landowners are able to afford, especially in my area. I hear uh, ranchers talking all the time about just not being able to put out enough fertilizer uh, even to meet the requirements of their soil test. And I think uh, that, that stresses the importance of the soil test uh, as fertilizer costs increase. We certainly don't want to waste our money by putting out unnecessary nutrients. So take those soil tests, do a good thorough job of collecting those soil samples. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with that process, make sure you you uh, get with your local county extension agent or a representative from USDA and RCS and, and have them uh, give you more information on how to take an adequate soil test. Uh, reduction in uh, commercial fertilizer use. Um, 
is something that, that may happen as a result of soil testing. You know, you may find that you just don't need uh, that additional fertilizer. And again, using those legumes may be a way to recoup some of that nitrogen without as much cost as, as commercial fertilizer. I would also encourage the renovation or aeration of your pasture land. Uh, in our area of, of Texas, we've got a lot of old corn and cotton farmland. Uh, there's a hard pan there that just needs to be broken up after years and years of farming. And then, of course, after corn and cotton went out, there's been years and years of uh, livestock on and hay production on that land, so it's just continued to be compacted. So it's important in the winter months uh, when when our warm season grasses are dormant to use aeration. And uh, this helps promote uh, water infiltration uh, when we do receive rainfall, and it will also promote better forage. Uh, we, we would want to stress the importance of using a, a rolling spike type aeration uh, device if you're uh, if you have native grasses, uh, remember that native grasses are bunch type grasses and if we uh, do aeration perhaps with a thick shank uh, type aeration device, we may uproot those native grasses and, and do more damage than good uh, in, that, in that particular situation. Individual plant treatment in terms of brush management is certainly something that we promote. Uh, within Texas AgriLife Extension. Many of you are familiar with our Brush Busters program. Uh, it's selective, it's cost effective, uh, it helps us uh, create diversity out there in the habitat. It also helps us reduce those uh, potential invasive species that we might have that may even threaten uh, wildlife habitat or even threaten additional grazing that we might need for livestock. So uh, using individual plant treatment uh, would also help us reduce the amount of chemicals that we have uh, or are using on the property and again be more in line with that reduction in, in chemicals like we talked about earlier in managing our hay meadows and pasture land. Creating brush piles is something that uh, is very common in our area, especially for those folks who are uh, under a wildlife management plan. Uh, <clears throat> these brush piles are small piles, uh, not large piles that are piled by a bulldozer, you know, after you've cleared land. We're talking about hand piled small brush piles that uh, basically have the, the larger wood on the bottom um, and will you know, decay over time and, and provide that cover for small mammals such as rabbits and maybe even provide cover for birds such as quail if we, if we have quail in the area. Again, it's a great way to provide that, that habitat and uh, very uh, uh, cost effective. I mean, if we're going to do brush clearing and we're going to have uh, brush available, we can certainly keep it in a brush pile for wildlife habitat. You know, and many of us have trees now that uh, have died due to the drought and we're looking for something to do with those limbs and, and all that uh, wood that comes with those dead trees and using them as brush piles for wildlife habitat is certainly a great use of those those uh, items. Prescribed burning is becoming more and more popular, especially in our area of Texas. Uh, um, there's a, a big effort to promote prescribed burning and uh, education of, of folks who are interested in prescribed burning and I would say that that's the most important thing in my mind is to educate yourself about prescribed burning. Uh, many of us aren't familiar with this process. We don't understand it and therefore we're, we're fearful of it. So learn more about it. Uh, even if you're uh, not uh, really considering using prescribed burning as a tool, I, uh, I think you should learn more about it so that you understand why others are using it. NRCS and Texas Parks and Wildlife Department can help you develop a plan for prescribed burning on your property. Uh, development of that plan is a critical part of the uh, prescribed burning process, so uh, certainly don't leave that step out. Then you want to make sure that you follow that plan. And then uh, also uh, on an equal level of importance is to get some help. 
Uh, one way that uh, you're able to get help is uh, through uh, prescribed uh, burning uh, associations or co-ops that are being formed in different areas of the state. These are people that are volunteering to come and help you do prescribed burning on your property. Uh, these people are knowledgeable about prescribed burns and, and there to help. So learn about those uh, potential uh, uh, resources in your community and, and get some help from those folks. Some of the benefits that we have from using prescribed fire, um, prescribed fire can help us improve our accessibility to our pasture land. Uh, it can also increase that forage production uh, and browse that we have available to wildlife and livestock. <clears throat> it does help us suppress those brush species and it can help us control selected forbs and, and grass species that don't um, uh, provide any benefit to us. And it can help improve the diversity and the uh, composition of the herbaceous uh, uh, plants out there in the, in the habitat. Fence line management is also something to consider uh, as a Young man growing up in the piney woods of East Texas, I thought fence line management uh, meant uh, going out with your dad and uh, post hole diggers and staples and and a hammer and and doing fence repair. But now that uh, I've uh, I've been in this career and uh, obtained a degree in in wildlife, uh, I understand that fence line management is much much more than that. So uh, you know we can we can uh, spray those fence rows, or we can save that money in chemical application and allow those fence rows to grow up, and that does create some habitat for birds and small mammals on our property. We may want to be selective in the fence rows that we allow to grow up in vegetation. Perhaps the the fence row that's out by the road that all the neighbors pass by every day is not the one that we want to allow to grow up. Maybe it's those that are uh, deeper into the property that uh, others don't see that, that we'll choose for that particular management purpose. Nest boxes are another important consideration uh, to provide some supplemental shelter uh, for wildlife on your property. Uh, and certainly uh, eastern bluebirds take the nest boxes quite easily, as well as wood ducks, owls, squirrels, and, and also bats. So uh, think about nest boxes and incorporating those into your wildlife management plans. I think you'll you'll enjoy those very much. It will help you see those uh, small species that you don't often see, and uh, you can really uh, get some enjoyment with the kids and grandkids out of monitoring, especially those eastern bluebird nest boxes. So, uh, if you've never used nest boxes before, uh, you should certainly uh, give them a try. They're an excellent uh, tool for supplemental shelter. As I mentioned earlier, I think it's important to know about our woodland areas. Many of us may have these, some of us may not. Uh, we need to provide uh, exclusion from cattle grazing in these woodland areas. We'd like to exclude cattle grazing from about mid-August to February to prevent competition of those cattle with, with browse that might be available to, to other wildlife species. But if we can't do that, perhaps we need to use our, our woodland areas for winter cover, maybe for cattle. Uh, think about uh, allowing those cattle in and out of that area intermittently. Uh, again, making sure that we we provide some electric or permanent fencing so we can tr control the animals moving in and out of there. But don't just uh, let our cattle stay in the woods uh, uh, over long periods of time. We want to use that as another pasture and rotate those animals in and out of there. Uh, our woodland areas also provide a, a lot of different cover and a variety of cover types for our different wildlife species that we might have on the property. Protection of our riparian areas, if we have those creeks or streams or maybe even a, a major uh, waterway that comes through the property, we need to protect those. Um, we can protect those by fencing. Uh, we can also uh, exclude cattle from there uh, to prevent erosion. Uh, this helps improve water quality, uh, especially in, 
It provides us with some wildlife habitat for different species that we may not see in other areas of the property. So uh, if you have a, a riparian area, it's it's very important to protect it. As, as we think about riparian areas, we know that cattle will often travel to these areas and and uh, use them as a water source and over time just the habit of cattle trailing one behind the other we create those trails down to the water source and then those uh, trails become waterways and and uh, we uh, just increase the chance of erosion and sedimentation and changing the water quality in that stream so consider those things if you have a riparian area and also look for those invasive species that might be uh, creeping in in those riparian riparian areas and, and try to control those. Ponds are an important water source for us on many small acreages. Uh, many folks like to have a, a pond on their place. It just provides a, uh, another element to the place and certainly is a, a great habitat in itself that uh, can be used for lots of different things. Uh, recreation is probably one of the main ones that uh, ponds are used for in our area. Uh, if you don't have a pond and you want to consider a pond as a water source and a habitat, then I would encourage you to visit with the folks at USDA NRCS. Uh, they're experts in uh, helping you find the, the suitable site on your property to construct a pond. Uh, they have information that can help you uh, do the right thing and, and create a pond that's going to be useful to you over the long term. Now as we began the program, uh, I told you that we were going to approach from the perspective that uh, we had cattle and we were managing cattle on small acreage, considering wildlife and trying to maintain our ag valuation. Well, another option for maintaining that ag valuation now is to write a wildlife management plan for the property and convert over to management under that wildlife plan. Uh, one of the, the great things about that is we can use livestock in our plan as a management tool, but we're not held to that degree of intensity with those livestock that we may be if we're trying to use livestock to maintain our ag valuation. Uh, we can also use our land for more recreational value. We can enjoy it more. We're not always worried about uh, going out and putting hay out or feed out for the cows or, uh, you know, making sure that fence is Ended, those types of things so we can we can switch over and I see in our area as, as folks get older that may have had cattle all their life that this is a great option for them to move into a wildlife management plan to maintain their ag valuation. Uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, AgriLife Extension, Texas Parks and Wildlife, all these state and federal agencies can help you with assistance on developing a wildlife management plan. Another thing that I think is important to to uh, bring out in this presentation is that uh, you should join uh, a wildlife management association if there's one available in your area or think about uh, maybe starting a wildlife management association. It's a great way to meet your neighbors. It's a great way for folks to put uh, their land together and create larger, more contiguous areas of grazable acres and wildlife habitat. And it's also a way for you to to uh, receive education. Uh, I know here in Washington County, both Texas Parks and Wildlife Department and AgriLife Extension work closely with the Wildlife Management Association to help them develop uh, and deliver quality educational programs to their membership. Also, I wanted to mention some of the great uh, programs, federal programs that USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service offers. These incentive programs help provide money to landowners to do some of the practices that we talked about today. Uh, the first program is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, uh, which can provide us with things such as money to, to install cross fencing, uh, livestock water wells, livestock pipelines, uh, grass planting. Uh, the money can also be used for brush control. And then the Wildlife Habitat Incentives Program is another great program which has a more wildlife focus, uh, whereas EQIP would be one that you would use uh, if you're trying to manage livestock. Um, the Wildlife Habitat Incentives Program focuses more on wildlife habitat. And for those folks that may have a riparian area, 
uh, on their property. The CCRP program is a great one that can help you uh, with fencing to reduce uh, access to those riparian areas from livestock and again help uh, develop better water quality in those streams and rivers and uh, that uh, program offers some uh, uh, lease payments to you for the amount of land that's taken out of use and fenced in that riparian area. So if you want to learn more about those, you can certainly go to the USDA website or uh, visit your local USDA NRCS office in the county where you live. Some additional resources that I wanted to bring to your attention today include our Texas AgriLife Extension Bookstore. Uh, many of our extension publications are located there at agrilifebookstore.org. There are also books for sale and publications for sale. Uh, it's a great resource just to go to and browse through and, and see all the different things that are available there. Also, a very useful site is the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department site. And uh, as well, I, I often refer to the Texas A&M University uh, Department of Wildlife and Fishery Science website at wildlife.tamu.edu. It's a great uh, source of information and uh, one of the neat things that you'll find there is a link to the um, uh, Southern Region Aquaculture Center's uh, publications that deal with ponds and, and pond management. Well, that's all I have. I'd be happy to uh, answer questions at this time. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today and I hope I gave you some useful common sense things to think about if you're considering uh, cattle and wildlife on small acreage. Great. Thank you so much, Larry. Um, folks, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them there in your chat box and send them to uh, all participants and we'll get them answered. Looks like we already have one question that came in. Um, Selena would like to know if your property already has KR blue stem on it, uh, how can you shred or disc or something along those lines and prevent the KR from spreading to those newly disturbed areas? Uh, KR blue stem is one of those um, introduced grasses that uh, you know was planted in many areas of Texas as um, corn and cotton farming went out of production and we were trying to create pasture land and uh, it's one of those species that spreads well from seed and uh, you know uh, other than chemical control I don't know any other method to uh, eliminate it from moving to, to areas where it's undesirable and uh, you know I can also tell you that uh, there's really no great answer even with chemical control uh, really uh, a glyphosate herbicide would be uh, really one of the, the most common choices that people would pick for uh, KR blue stem control but again that that is a non-selective type chemical okay thank you and uh, we'll give a few more minutes here to see if anybody else has any questions Let's see, we've got a comment here that Pastora helps suppress the blue stem. Uh, any more questions out there? Okay, we'll go ahead and start wrapping it up then. But folks, if you do have a question, feel free to keep typing it in and we'll be checking before we get off the line here. Uh, Larry, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, on behalf of AgriLife and TWA, we appreciate your time and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, folks, we appreciate you all tuning in. The Wildlife for Lunch webinar series is held every month. And uh, next month, on June 21st, we're going to be discussing ranch photography for fun and profit with John Martin. He's going to be our guest presenter. So we encourage you all to tune back in then. And um, un undoubtedly, he'll have some great photos in his presentation and, um, so we can all enjoy those. Um, and uh, again, if you're going to uh, get the CEU credit, um, Oh, hang on, we've got one question here. Is shredding for weed control acceptable as wildlife management? Certainly. If you're uh, under a wildlife management plan, you can uh, certainly uh, do selective shredding for, for weed control. Um, 
again, you know, you would want to be uh, selective about those areas and not mow all of it at once. Maybe a patchwork or a mosaic kind of design, or, or maybe mowing some trails that you uh, frequent to monitor your nest boxes. Those types of things uh, would be important. But it is a practice that you can use, certainly. Okay, great. Any other questions out there? Just feel free to keep typing them in. Uh, for folks who are interested in receiving the CEU credit, when you close out of this window, um, a, a window will automatically open with that CEU survey. Uh, make sure that you fill that out and, um, and get that back to us. It'll submit that to us. Um, let's see, there's a question here about downloading the presentation and keeping it for reference later. Um, and um, the presentation will it has been recorded and it will be available on the TWA website. Um, it'll probably be up next week. We have to edit it a little bit, but then it'll be up on that website as well. Um, and if you go to the TWA, I'll give you the actual address here for where it will really be. Uh, but if you go to the TWA website, it's located under resources and then uh, webinars. Um, and there's a direct link to it. And you can see all of the past uh, webinars on there as well. Um, next month's webinar is going to be Ranch Photography for Fun and Profit presented by John Martin. Um, and so uh, hopefully everybody can tune in then. Um, again, if you're going to do CEU credit, make sure you fill out that survey and give us your uh, contact info so that we can get the certificate to you. Um, and if you're not looking for CEU credit but you want to give us some feedback, please fill out that survey. We, we'd love to hear from you all and know how we're doing and what we can do to, uh, to get better at this. Um, Larry, thank you so much for everything. And again, folks, on behalf of TWA and AgriLife Extension, thank you for tuning in today. If anybody has any questions or concerns, you can contact me, uh, Courtney Britton, at the Texas Wildlife Association. I'm going to give you my email here. Um, anytime you need, I'll be available to handle all your um, issues for CEUs or Wildlife for Lunch webinar series. Um, Larry, thank you so much, and uh, hopefully we'll see everybody back here next month. You're very welcome. I enjoyed it. I appreciate everybody listening in. Oh, and Larry, one more quick question here. We have a comment that says, NRCS discourages use of prescribed burning in our SNW conservation district. Do you know if this is a statewide trend? Um, I would say no, it's not a statewide trend uh, simply because uh, we are using prescribed burning in our area, uh, you know, and we have a soil and water conservation district that uh, has been a part of uh, working with that group to get it organized. Uh, so, you know, I would say that's probably just a local trend and, and it may just be uh, that uh, their knowledge is, is limited perhaps on the use of prescribed burning. and and uh, they, they may need some more education and, and sometimes you know the, the demand from the clientele and the public helps uh, drive what, uh, what we do as state and federal agencies. So. Excellent. And let's see, there's uh, another question here about getting the slides from this presentation. Again, the archived recorded version uh, will be on the website and um, when you click on, on that website there, you'll actually be redirected to the, the TWA YouTube page and you can download um, presentations from YouTube there. Um, so if you need it that way or you can always reach out to Larry or myself and we'll see what we can do to help anybody out there who needs slides. Um, and just it looks like there's another comment there just to let everybody know that there's a prescribed burn video available from NRCS um, for education purposes. So um, you can probably hit up their website and find that um, if anybody is looking for that. Um, I think that's about all the questions. It looks like they've come through. So um, again, Larry, thank you so much and thanks to everybody for participating today and we look forward to seeing you all again on the next Wildlife for Lunch webinar. Thank you.